I feel proud to introduce today's resource person. She is an engineering graduate from PhD College of Technology in 1989. Obtained master's degree in business administration from Bharatiya University, specializing in operations and another degree in foreign trade from Pondicherry University. She completed her PhD in 2016 at Amrita School of Business. She has been teaching and undertaking consultancy assignments and training for the last 20 years, held administrative position in educational institutions. At present, she serves as an assistant professor at Amrita School of Business, Coimtur campus. She received Best Paper Award for Early Operations Track in 7th Doctoral Collegium at Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. She received so many awards, honors, and scholarships, and also published papers in journals and articles. On behalf of her management, staff, and students, I accord a cordial welcome to you, dear ma'am. Technical support it is a vital part of a webinar. So I wholeheartedly welcome Sister Dr. Shanta Mary Joshita, Head and Assistant Professor of Computer Science and her team. I congratulate Dr. N. Lavanya Lakshmi, convener, and Mrs. M. Revati, organizing secretary, and all the members who are working day and night to shine their performance. As COVID-19 continues to impact every aspect of society, the global supply chain is being squeezed even tighter than it was before the pandemic hit. Supply chain is a broad range of activities required to plan, control, and execute production flow from material to production, distribution in more economical way possible. I ensure this session will be profitable and the next few hours will be fruitful for every one of us. Once again, I welcome you all. This is all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for wonderful welcoming. Champions keep playing until they get it right. It is a quote that shoots our principal, Reverend Sister, Dr. S. J. Surani, who always motivate us to do the things effectively and efficiently. Let me invite our principal, Reverend Sister, S. J. Surani, to deliver the inaugural address. Am I audible? Yes, Sister. Dear resource person of the webinar, Dr. K. Hemalada. Sister, your oh. voice is not audible. Sister? Yeah, here. Ah, here now, it's, now it's audible, sister. Dear resource persons of the webinar, Dr. K. K. Malada, Assistant Professor Amida School of Business, Koyambuthur, Dr. Ravana Rachmi, convener of this webinar, Mrs. Rev, the organization secretary of this webinar, HOD of BBA, Jasmine, other faculty members of the Department of Business Administration, dear participants of this webinar, a very pleasant morning to every one of you. The lockdown due to COVID-19 pandemic has given us an opportunity to attend webinars like this from our place itself but it has affected societies and economies around the globe in a broad range of issues like trade, governance, health, labor, technology, and so on. It is continuously unfolding and reshaping our world. COVID-19 pandemic has hit global trade and investment to a greater extent Multinational companies focused on initial supply shock. Then a demand shock as more as more countries ordered people to stay at home. Governments, business, and individual consumers suddenly struggled to procure basic products and materials. The urgent need to design smarter, stronger, and more diverse supply chains has been one of the main lessons of this crisis business opportunities are like buses always another one comes 
Dear participants, I hope this webinar will let us know about the drastic change in supply chain changes and as a consumer, how we can tackle the COVID-19 crisis. At this juncture, I congratulate the conveners for selecting a nice topic as supply chains in the post COVID world, which will be useful for all. I also appreciate the meticulous efforts in planning and conducting this webinar in a successful manner. Thank you, dears. Thank you very much. May God bless you. Stay home and stay safe. Stay home and stay safe. Bye bye. Enjoy the day. Thank you, sister, for your blissful address. Challenges or gift that forces us to search for a new center of gravity. Fight them and find a new way to stand is the words often reflects from the action of Mother Superior and Secretary Reverend Sister Dr. B.J. Quinsley Jainti of our college. So it is the right time and right person to felicitate us. May I invite Reverend Sister Dr. B.J. Quinsley Jainti to felicitate the gathering. Mrs. Lavanya, are you able to hear me? Yes, sister, it's audible. Mrs. Lavanya? Yes, sister, okay, it's sir. audible. Okay, thank you. Good morning to all. I welcome all the participants to this webinar. It is my pleasure and a great uh, joy to welcome our resource person, Dr. Hema Mala, for having given a consent to be the resource person for this webinar. I take this opportunity to appreciate Dr. Ms. Dr. Uh, Mrs. Jasmine Selvabakiam, HOD of BBA uh, Business Administration Department and the convener of this webinar, Dr. Mrs. Lavanya Lakshmi, Assistant Professor and Organizing Secretary of this webinar, and all the staff members for their cooperation and coordination for, and for organizing the seminar on current topic as this is the need of the hour. COVID-19 pandemic has hit global trade and investment at an unprecedented speed and scale. In the beginning, the multinational companies faced an initial supply shock and then demand shock as more and more countries ordered their people to stay at home. Governments, business and individual customers struggled to get basic materials and products and are forced to confront the fragility of the supply chain. Here, I would like to explain what are the problems we have faced during the lockdown period. The very beginning day when lockdown was announced, people were in a hurry and they rushed to their shops and purchased the things as much as possible with the expectation that they won't get the materials in the future and the price of the materials will be very high in the future. I experienced some difficulties in purchasing the necessary goods for us. So in the evening, I have placed an order for buying 30 packets of Surf Excel but I was not able to get that surf excel in Periculum and I tried to get it from Thaini. From Thaini also, I was not able to get it. Finally, I was able to get only 15 packets of Ariel. So in that case, we would like to use surf excel because of the absence, lack of supply, absence of supply of the particular product, we were forced to buy Ariel, that is also only 15 packets I was able to get. The another example, once I went to Thaini for official purpose, I saw a poor farmer who has kept a vehicle full of banana and he was not able to sell the banana and he was shouting. In that case, the supply was more, but there was no demand. People were afraid of buying the banana out of the fear of 
covid uh, corona virus so in that case the poor farmer might have thought that he can get more money from his investment at the time of investment but it was not possible for him and he was not able to get back the money that he has invested <coughs> sorry the next one in our local area the wise man and the one bakery owner he has made use of this opportunity and he has packed all the eatables and all the bakery items in the proper manner and he used to receive the orders over the phone and he delivered all the materials at the door so in that case he was able to manage the demand of the consumers so all these things shows that the weakness of our supply chain system so this covid 19 pandemic has urged us to design a smarter a stronger and diverse supply chains and this has been one of the lessons of the covid 19 <coughs> the covid 19 is challenging the business so business in the sense they have to think in unique and different ways the disruptions that are caused by the covid 19 has created a consciousness among the customers about how to buy the things where to buy the things when to buy the things and how to buy the things so they are all very cautious so in that case diverse supply chain and digitization will be the fundamental element in building the strong supply chains <coughs> sorry i hope our resource person will enlighten you on this supply chain in the post covid period so if we are not able to uh, build a strong supply chain the whole economic system will be affected and uh, there won't be any balance between the supply and the demand so our um, resource person will give you proper information and enable you to have proper knowledge on establishing the some strong sufficient supply chain wish you all the best may god bless you thank you thank you sister for your pleasurable felicitation now instruction to the participant use chat box only for clarifying the doubts towards the end of the session feedback link will be posted in the chat box filling it is mandatory to get e certificate madam hema mala krishna madam now the yes. floor is open to you madam madam is it audible madam hema mala yes yes uh, lavanya i can hear you okay. can you people hear me yes ma'am it's audible ma'am now the floor is open to you ma'am thank you lavanya thank you ma'am good morning uh, to uh, mother superior and all the uh, sisters um i'm happy to meet you all virtually of course today and um share a few ideas on this very interesting topic on supply chain uh, just allow me to share my screen ma'am what ma'am uh i'm sharing my screen okay ma'am so, okay ma'am you can share your screen ma'am i hope you are able to see my presentation yes ma'am yes ma'am yes, ma okay. yeah this um has always been a, a very interesting topic it's a fascinating field and it is something that uh, i had always loved to teach and uh, research um i uh, thank you and your team for the invitation again and uh, to the participants i understand you are uh, business administration students and i hope you also will find this area interesting what you see is a black swan and my question to you is is covid going to be a black swan it's a never before event no benchmarks to compare the results if impact is more dramatic more global and more unusual 
than any other epidemic the world had seen before. Both people's lives and livelihoods are at risk. And it is many things. And most importantly, first, it is a human crisis, you know? uh, a health crisis with unknown consequences, unknown lethality. Second, it brings a new economic reality. It is not a recession. It is not even a depression. It is um, a complete paralysis. Economies of the world have come to a grinding halt, a complete standstill. Border closures, quarantine and lockdowns, markets, supply and trade disruptions, it is a black swan event. And what is a black swan event? An unpredictable event that is beyond what is normally expected of a situation and has a potential severe consequences. Events that are characterized by their extreme rarity, very, very rare events, and their severe impact. And they simply seem so obvious after they occur. You know, it is like, how did we miss the times? COVID, we all understand, is indeed a black swan event, and it is going to define our new reality. And this is my question. What is going to be our new no normal? We will see people distancing socially, dis uh, socializing differently, people covering their faces behind masks, washing their hands more often, saying namaskaram instead of hi-fi or a handshake. You know, we'll see people buying more from home, working from home more, learning more from home, teaching more from home, and eat from home more. They move lesser, they travel lesser. People will earn, shop, buy, spend, and socialize differently. What does all this mean to business and their supply chains? Let's take a closer look at what is happening to businesses. We are seeing in the last few months of crisis that a certain kind of businesses are thriving, doing well, and a few very well. But a few other businesses are unfortunately not. Could um, any one of you tell me, you can type in the chat box, as Lavanya said, what do you think are the businesses that you see are doing very well now during this pandemic crisis? We are all in the lockdown. No. Do you see any kind of businesses that are uh, doing well? Well, I have my answer. <clears throat> E-learning. We need to keep learning and to complete our degrees. Home entertainment, you know, on the top companies, OTT companies as they call, that stream entertainment in internet, medical supplies and products, you know, the sanitizers, masks, gloves, overalls, etc. Supermarkets are doing well, and you know why. Software makers, particularly those who facilitate working from home, making working uh, from home easier. Delivery services, we can't go out, they need to come to us. Online gaming is another one I could think of. There are people who suddenly have lots of time to kill doing nothing at home. Cleaning services, because we need professional help in cleaning and sanitizing our common spaces, institutions, offices, and even supplements and non-conventional medications. It seems to be attracting special attention now. Um, Lavanya, can I uh, stop very briefly? Uh, I see stuff on my screen. Um, I 
would rather like not to have it on my screen. Can I have the control of my screen, please? Lavanya? Ah, okay, thank you. Um, all right. So, um, so um, what we are seeing here is we are seeing these businesses getting busy, so busy that there are new entrants coming in, even small cottage units making innovative attempts. You know, the housewives making sanitizers, our corner shop, Kirana owner, shop owner making WhatsApp groups, Facebook pages. You know, they are uh, having a community of customers selling stuff, you know, like Arial, uh, Surfexel, um, taking those stuff to their customers, meat, milk, vegetables, they're all getting home delivered, right? <clears throat> Unfortunately, we also hear many other businesses are not doing so well. We'll see why. We'll see what they are and we'll see why. The first thing that I've seen not doing well are real estates. No, people are not doing well. No job security, no home buying, commercial real estate is dull, office venues closed, shopping venues closed, entertainment places are closed, delay in construction, you know, the construction is not happening, people are not buying houses, people are not constructing houses, because there is a delay in construction material supply, there is shortage of labor, working from home is happening, so office utilization is falling, so as a result, <clears throat> real estate business is getting hit. The next thing we see getting very badly hit is automobiles. I don't know if you noticed, Indian car sales has logged in zero in the month of April, zero sales in April. No movement, people are not moving, no job security. People are living in the fear of getting fired or not getting salary or half pay or that half pay could be delayed. You know, no job security now. Tourism, travel, they are down. And demand is slumping in domestic and export markets. Components and parts are not moving and there is a shortage in labor. Well, I really do not know what that arrow mark means, whoever is placing it, if you could allow me to do that. And if you have questions, I'll take it later. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And there is agriculture and food processing industry. You know, there are 140 million farm households across our country. Goods are perishable. They are raising fruits, vegetables, grains, crops. They're all perishable and there is no movement on road. There is logistic slum and the produce is getting perished and dumped. It's really a sad thing to see and ag that agriculture is getting super hit. And then we have banking, no activity, no production, no selling, no revenue, therefore no returns. What happens as a result, loans are going bad, the money borrowed, debts are going bad. People are not able to return. Money is not coming back to banks. There is a cash crisis. And for banks, bad debts are accumulating. And the payback period, the time that the borrowers are taking to pay back is, is delayed, extension of payback period. And this does not stop here. And if you just uh, uh, you know, do some quick thinking, when banking goes bad, real estate goes bad. People are not able to buy houses, places. When real estate and automobiles go bad, steel goes bad. Nobody to buy steel. The steel goes bad, energy sector suffers. And it's a vicious cycle. One sector pulls another. And of course, there is another group of businesses. Airlines, entertainment, restaurant and hospitality, your beauty parlors, spa, gym places. I really don't even have to begin talking about this. We all know what is what happened, how it happened and why it happened. And as a, as a result, why these businesses are down and slow. So what are our insights here? There are these businesses that are doing good because there is demand. 
for a business to do good, it needs demand. It needs people to buy. When the demand is stable, that is great. And if it is, the even greater is when the demand is growing. And the best thing that can happen to business is that growing demand is also predictable, meaning businesses know that they have demand, a growing demand, and I can predict this. What is the next insight? For a business to do well, they need supplies to be coming. I need to service the demand. So I need to have my supplies coming and those supplies must be uninterrupted and that must be coming at low cost. You know? When that does not happen, you really cannot sell even if you have a growing demand that you predicted it so accurately. There's yet another most important thing that happens that businesses need to get enough supply to meet demand. And not only should it be uninterrupted, but I should have enough you know, to meet the amount of demand. You saw what was happening in um, toilet paper. The demand was there, huge spike, all that is happening, but I don't have enough supply. Then I suffer. There was a period when supermarkets were closed and suffering because they didn't have enough supply to meet demand. Wow, that's a great art. But do we need that now? Thank you. And here is insight. Businesses, they need means to get their products to their customers. There is a demand, think of this, there is a demand, good demand, growing demand, and I know that there is a demand. I have supplies, I have materials that are required to make my product, and I have enough of them. Look at what is happening to agriculture. I raised beautiful watermelons, you know, there is a lot of milk, meat, grain, and there are people who want all this. But unfortunately, I cannot get all my produce to the customers. There is no logistic support. Roads are closed. I really can't do that. So in spite of having a demand and a supply, my business suffered. And then the most important is the businesses need customers to be paying. Look at the real estate. There is demand. There is supply. You really don't have to move the place to anywhere. But unfortunately, customers do not have enough either cash or the security, job security, to pay for their <coughs> places. So customers, unless they pay, your supply chains, your businesses can't be up. All right. Okay. So how does it all sum up to? We saw a set of businesses that are not doing well another set of businesses that are doing super good. And the underlying lesson is that those businesses that respond quickly to the changes in their demand, they survive, they thrive. What does it mean? I mean, what are the questions? that It means that we need to ask questions, basically ask yourself a few questions and get honest answers. Do I have a mechanism to sense the changes in my market? Yes, market is changing. Some things are demanded, some things are demanded less, some demanded more. Oh, thank you. Somebody is getting really mischievous. All right. Okay. So that, I do I have a radar to pick up all those clues from the market about demand? And then do I have what it takes to exploit these changes favorably? But now that I know what is happening, do I have a mechanism to make use of this as an opportunity rather than as a challenge? And am I flexible enough to create the value that my market wants? So I have been making um, t-shirts all the while, but now because there is a demand for uh, masks, can I use the same facility to stop making t-shirts, which is not wanted in the market now and start making masks that are demanded more and more. And then we have uh, another serious question, all that is said and done, do I even have the capability to rise up to the challenge that the market is posing on my business? So can I make the stuff? Do I have suppliers who can support me? And that comes as my, the next crucial question. Do I have the ecosystem to support, to serve my customer? 
Do I have suppliers? Do I have good logistics partners? Do I have good custom clearance agencies? Do I have good carriers? This is my ecosystem. I may be able to produce super good quality of uh, a product that the market needs so much, and I have lots that I have made, but do I have the support from my supply chain partners to get them to my customers on time at the right quality, at the right price? So I insist the underlying lesson, the whole um, you know, message for the supply chains is that if I am a business that can sense and respond quickly to the changes in the demand in my market, then I am a business that survives, that thrives, right? It is now time to stop and understand what supply chains are. What are supply chains? You know, we heard sister talk about supply chains. You know, we'll see what it takes to understand a supply chain. What you have in front of you on your screen is a car of today. Okay? Most modern with all contemporary features. It is a connected car, so there is a need to add a connectivity mechanism, communication, cybersecurity. And there is a car automation mechanism. And so there is a navigation system and a sensor setup. There's an auto repair mechanism and driver safety. And as you see, you know, then you have engine, transmission, tire, and battery, and you need systems to uh, track and enhance their performance. And oh yes, it is a car, not a spaceship. And if you have noticed, each system is provided by different suppliers. And if you have also noticed, they come from different parts of the world. You make the car, you sell it to your customer. Now, imagine if one of these suppliers happened to be in China, no surprise at all, or even Italy or Germany, France or Spain, will you be able to complete your assembly today in these pandemic times? Let us trace the journey of this car to you, the customer. Look at it. Materials, parts, components, or sub-assemblies come from these various suppliers, you know, the, uh, the original equipment manufacturers, to the auto assemblers, the manufacturer. That could be Toyota, Tata Motors, Mercedes, or Ford, right? You need all the glass, rubber, plastic, everything coming to the OEMs, and OEMs put together parts and sub-assemblies, sell them to the manufacturers, okay? and the manufacturer does the assembly, the car is assembled and tested and done. The logistics partner, a third-party logistics company arranges to get the car to the market. It could be overseas or even domestic. If overseas, there is a customs clearance. And if the customs clearance is not here, and if you are, your market is domestic market, it could be in the picture when you are importing your parts. Now, do you know that the seat warming de devices, you know, seats need to be kept warm during very cold winters in countries like Russia, US, uh, Canada. You know, those seat warming, there are devices that warm your seat. Those devices and the seat themselves, the reclining seats, the seats that are adjustable. They are made from India, the biggest manufacturers in India and is imported to even China and Europe, including Germany. And that's news to me. I just found that out very recently. Not to mention the horns, the steering wheels, the dashboard designs, even for the global brands like Lamborghini, BMW, Ford, and General Motors, they're all made in India. And then you have your carriers, you know, uh, they are uh, your trucking company, transportation companies, moving your cars to your dealers. And those dealers tell you how many they want for their customers who are your end users, your end consumers. And this is your supply chain. When there is a network of organizations making different products or services come together 
to create and deliver the value in this case a car to the end customer the person who's the consumer the person who is using the car this network of organizations is called a supply chain now this is how a supply chain a generic supply chain looks for any looks like for any product you know we could be talking about a loaf of bread a, a, a cup of barista uh, you know a coffee um, your t-shirt a pair of pants uh, could be any product and this is how your supply chain looks like there are suppliers and of course not what is what is hidden from this um, uh, network is the suppliers, suppliers, their suppliers, and their suppliers. You know, it can go on and on to the uh, towards upstream. But what we see is your immediate tier one suppliers supplying parts to manufacturers who convert the raw material into finished goods, and then they send it to their, they keep it in their warehouse and send it to their distributors who take delivery from these people for distributing among a, a chain of retailers. And then retailers are in direct touch with your customers. They sell the product to the customers. And your customer, either he buys to use it for himself or herself or to somebody else who is consumer. So when you are talking about a supply chain like this, right, <clears throat> you have to make several crucial decisions. Like there are five crucial areas. We even call them as drivers of your supply. What drives your supply chain? What moves your supply chain? What makes your supply chain a good one, bad one, ugly one? You know, so they are all the decisions that you make fall under five categories. One is the decisions that you make on what to produce, when to produce, and how to produce. And then you have these decisions that you make in terms of your stock, your inventory. How many should I move and how many should I store? And if I'm storing, where do I store, right? And then that takes us to the next important category of decisions you make. Now that I made and I stopped, how many should I move? And when should I move? Where do I move? What time, how, what mode, at what cost? So these are another major kind of decisions that you make in your supply chains. And, most expensive decisions that you make here are the ones on location. Where am I going to have my uh, warehouse? How many factories am I going to have? And where am I going to have these factories? Who are going to be my uh, carrier partners and where are they going to be? So these location decision, how best to do each activity is a very expensive decision that you make whose impact is with you for a very long time to come. And of course, you have information as a very, very potent driver in this time of connected world. If you want to better the quality of any of the other four categories of decision that you make, you need data. You need information. You need to convert this data from into information. You need to know where to collect the data. data. So these are the five major kinds of decisions you make Big on your supply chains. Customers, if you see today, anytime, customers want choice. They want features, options. They want customization and even personalization in certain cases. They want the best affordable quality. They don't want to settle for anything less. They, and they want it quick. And they want it all cheap. Every wish of your customer has an impact on your supply chain. And if you want to create some value for them so that they would be wanting, willing to uh, shell out their money for your product, and if you want to satisfy these customers, you want to delight your customers, your supply chain decisions change your supply chain. These decisions change your supply chain, right? Now, We'll be in a better position to know how COVID-19 has affected or is affecting each one of these decisions that you make about supply chain. Look at China. China is today the manufacturing hub of the world and it was closed for full three months. Supply is stuck. How much inventory can you hold? Three months worth of inventory? No way. 
I sell about 5,000 cars in a month and you want me to hold 15,000 cars in my inventory? It is expensive, no way. Auto assemblers and many other manufacturing organizations are operating lean. They are operating just in time. Lean and JIT, just in time means holding no surplus inventory on site. So I don't have inventory and supply stopped coming. How long can I hold on? Factories closed after two weeks of lockdown. No, this means no chemicals are coming from ph for our pharma companies. No diodes are coming. No semiconductor devices. No phones. No fertilizers. No minerals. China is closed. You look at China as a market. It is a 145 million huge market. So many people. They also buy stuff from us to the rest of the world. They buy iPhones, metals, iron ore, nickel, copper. They buy metals from us. They buy leather. They even buy rice, cotton. We sell big to China. China is a big market. We can't sell what we made now. We are making wastes. We are making losses. Now, China is opening. But the rest of the world has lost trust in the country. Trade barriers are expected. Trump is already talking um, about uh, trade barriers with China. Companies are moving out of China. Japan is incentivizing its companies to move out and come back to Japan. And the lure of all that cheap labor is lost. Labor is not cheap in China anymore. Look at what is happening to demand. My supply is getting disrupted. My demand is getting totally distorted. And China is just one example. We have UK, we have Italy, Germany, US, Mexico, and all other Latin American countries, South Korea and Thailand. The waves of this pandemic are starting and rising and ending, and may start again at different times, at different places. So what has COVID done to our supply chains? The answer is simply this. It has disrupted the supply. And worse, it has distorted the demand. And this is the now that we are all experiencing today. Now that leads us to more important question. What is tomorrow going to be like? More saving, less spending. How much now? How much later? That's the question. Right. People all around the uh, world, globe, are beginning to save more. Investors expect consumers to save more. Having spent the last few months spending almost nothing, they might have gotten used to it. Lower overheads, you know, lower expenditure, lower expenses, lower spend, some will realize is better than staring at the unpayable credit card balance at the end of every month. Increasingly, people spend lesser on discretionary goods. For how long? Unknown. So what do we expect for tomorrow? Buying becomes a cautious decision. So you, I, and everyone that we know are going to take a second thought on what to buy, where to buy, how, and when, we are going to shop. It's not easy with all the social distancing. What else do you expect? Demand is expected to shift across categories. What is essential will get redefined. So what was not essential has become, who was even thinking about buying hand sanitizers, two bottles every month before this pandemic? Did we even think of masks? Did they have become our new essentials? And what is not? Right? All this gets shifted. It's going haywire. And look at what is happening. Demand is going to shift towards digital products. Meaning if I'm going to read a book, it might as well be um, you know, a digital version. Music, books, movies, they all could become digital. Classes, they, you know, coaching, they all could become digital now, even if there is a physical version available. And the distribution is seeing newer trends. 
you know, as I told you, your parent, my parent went on Sunday mornings to buy fish and meat for home. Not anymore. Meat is getting uh, home delivered like milk. Liquor is could get home delivered. Yeah, you don't, maybe people, uh, government is doing a favor and people may not may be spared of efforts to go to uh, your liquor shop. Even healthcare is expected to be door delivered. No contact delivery. What is fresh is getting re-examined. People are stocking, people are hoarding. Shelf lives are getting redefined. Retail and wholesale could shift. People may uh, use their kitchens more. Supermarkets may be preferred over restaurants. And then there is this most obvious global to local shift. Travel restrictions are making more local produce, you know, making the local produce more charming. Shelf lives may have to be hiked. And I ask this again, what does this mean to our supply chains? Can the supply chains of tomorrow continue to be global? Think about it. The pandemic has taught everyone that we are too reliant on China. Why does China have to make, I mean, literally everything? Can there be over dependence on single source anymore? Or can we have a China plus one strategy just to be sure, just to be on the safer side? Can our supply chains continue to be rigid? Our supply chains of tomorrow, and we have heard, I know, you know, it's a very common saying that competition is not typically among businesses, but rather it is between the supply chains. It is going to be so, more so in the future. COVID-19 has showed us the weakest link in our supply chains. What kind of supply chains will win the tomorrow? Let's try and answer this question by looking at a few best practices that we saw happening during these COVID months. Working with its partners, Toyota created a database to visualize its supply networks for each component. If disaster strikes, Toyota can immediately identify the parts at risk. You know, how many parts go into the car, right? So which part is going to be in short supply, Toyota would know with this database. And the database identifies components that are supplied by only one manufacturer and that are difficult to replace. The company then decreases dependence on these solo providers by reducing this number of unique designs and sharing equipment specifications with parts, production facilities, and suppliers. You know what is actually happening? If it is going to make me really vulnerable, the Ashley's heel, then I am going to have a backup plan. That is what Toyota did by digitizing its database, its business its information. Toyota reduces risk by having one supplier produce 60% of the needed plans and two additional suppliers, each producing 20. And if it is a critical component, it gets even more safer. Thus adding suppliers in their home markets, domestic suppliers, not everyone is a foreign supplier to ensure its business continuity. So what matters here? that the businesses, when investments in digitizing the supply chain, when their investments are going into data-driven decision-making, it brings a lot of light in, inside the tunnel. It brings a lot of transparency. It brings a lot of visibility, and it makes your business more lit, more agile, quick to respond to a change. You can now respond to a challenge in your environment, and if your environment, quickly changes, quickly, rapidly, and intelligently, right? Another best practice to share, COVID-19 crisis has thrown a spotlight on companies that already have flexible production line. What is flexibility? You know, the, you know, the fashion industry has nothing to do with disinfectants and medical gear. You know, the 
stuff that doctors and uh, uh, frontline workers wear. But when the spread of COVID-19 overwhelmed the French and Italian healthcare system and showed its vulnerability, the, when their medical supplies ran short, luxury good manufacturers, you know, all those fashion houses, they overall their operations to make the most urgently needed items. Within 72 hours of the French government's call for businesses to pitch in, their perfume factories were now producing not perfumes, but hand sanitizers. Top fashion brands you would have heard, Armani, Gucci, Prada, they all quickly repurposed their designer clothing factories. They, do, they stopped making any more designer clothes in Italy to churn out medical overalls and Burberry, you know, it makes those, those very expensive trench coats. You see those, um, the matrix people wearing trench coats. It, the, its plant has been repurposed to make face masks and non-surgical gowns. Flexible supply chains played a very critical role. If you include rapid sourcing of raw material, if you also made a quick product design and development and super quick testing and distribution, then you are good to go. Companies in India also rose up to challenge. We know our Arvind Mills, JCT Mills, other textile mills in India started making uh, medical overalls and covers, not shirts and pants. You know, Maruti Suzuki, Mahindra and Mahindra Tata Motors, and even Hyundai started developing ventilators for our healthcare uh, systems. Um, uh, Hindustan Unilever Limited, Dabur, and even Amul got into hygiene products. See, what is special about these companies? All these companies knew what was wanted, where was it wanted, how much, and how quickly. They were making some other products. So, and most importantly, they could switch from making one product to another very quickly and with ease. The lesson is such supply chains survive. They grow. And we have one serious last quality that I want to discuss that supply chains should have, resilience. In fact, it is a very, very um, a human characteristic. Economic resilience in the face of black swans requires companies to do things differently. Our current economic model, you know, how do we operate now? Our economic model currently is always pursuing efficiency. Do more with less, right? Do better, do more, produce more. You find the quickest and cheapest way to do or make something. And you likely have a time or cost advantage. Why do we pursue this uh, relentlessly, this efficiency? Because I can save money, I can save time. But global supply chains that optimize for centralization, for efficiency, meaning all the decisions are made at the center, all the materials are procured by one person, all the recruitment happens in one place. This is called centralization. Why do they do this? To save time, to save cost. So global supply chains that optimize for centralization and reduced costs have serious potential weaknesses. They fell flat they died almost in these three months. Nothing can prevent the demand reductions that will come in the future from social distancing and severe cutbacks in travel and all other personal, um, you know, close proximity services. But more generally, supply chains got to really become resilient. And what is resilience? Resilience the power and capability to hold on to the face, hold on, you know, in the face of risk, in the face of adversity. It is a grit, it is a toughness. Tough, but flexible. There are some things organizations can do to reduce the risks to operations. They can build into their value chains, supply chains, some duplication some diversity, not over dependent on one thing. 
not putting all eggs in one basket. These are the key principles of resilience in nature itself. You know, we have two kidneys for a reason. You know, this resilience matters, this duplication matters in production and in suppliers. It has proven right. In the short run, multiple supply chain and production pathways may seem expensive, less than efficient, but they come in handy in an emergency. Businesses should value resilience and risk reduction in their plans and in their investment calculations, not just whatever gets them to the lowest cost today. Right? So what I'll do is now um, stop what I'm doing. Ah, oh, wow, that's a nice design. Thank you um, for questions. So I um, would like the person who was busy on the screen if it is all right, uh, to pick a question. I hope uh, you heard what I spoke for the last 30, 40 minutes, and uh, I'll be happy to answer uh, your question, take your question and answer it. Lavanya? Um, okay, ma'am. Uh, Madam Revati, are you in line? Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there any questions in the chat box? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, kindly put it. Okay. The resource person will answer. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Which morning. supply? Okay, ma'am. Which supply chain company is getting maximum profit under COVID situation? How it's possible? Um, as I told you, you know the those. Um, businesses like delivery services, digital services, um, OTT uh, businesses, and the businesses that are streaming entertainments on uh, over internet data, uh, e-learning, those are all uh, uh, businesses that are really doing well because there is a demand, because they have a product, and because they have a channel to get the product to their customers. They're doing really well. Okay, ma'am. Another question, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Another one more question, ma'am. Yes, please. Uh, small farmers does not able to know the well knowledgeable about the supply chains. Is there is any situation for solving the problem for rural area? Um, see, a lot of work is getting done because, you know, farmers, when they have um, they are produced, um, they have lots of middlemen in the supply chain for farming. Um, a lot of work is being done to remove middlemen. You know, even government is talking about uh, River Sunday farmers market where uh, cutting out of these middlemen who are taking all uh, the margins and giving the fresh produce to the customers, end users and end user paying directly to the farmer a lot of such work is happening. I think it is only we people who are, most of us who are sitting in business schools wondering if farmers know anything about supply chain. In fact, farmers know because they are in the receiving end. They are the ones who are getting hit by the length of their supply chain. A lot of work has been uh, happening. I see another question. Okay, ma'am. Another One more question, ma'am. Yeah. Why? Why the supply chain in interrupted by COVID nineteen? How do we get the increases our level of manufacturing state in their curial situation? Um. So meaning, uh, the question is how uh, COVID has affected. So as I told you, uh, there are two major things that are happening. One is people are not buying certain things anymore. And people are hoarding certain things anymore. I can see a question on that. I'll answer that next. People are hoarding certain things. Ma'am, um, they are asking how to increasing the manufacturing level, ma'am. Um, uh, jack up production, how to increase production. That's going to be very difficult. That's going to be, it will happen. It will definitely happen because uh, economists, including uh, Raghuram Rajan, you know, they are uh, predicting a V-shaped uh, curve to recovery. 
meaning immediately our production productivity is going to take a deep dive it's going to get hit uh, because all our labor migrant laborers have, laborers have gone back to their homes suppliers supply uh, is uh, delayed uh, it is going to be expensive um, power um, bank loans that they have borrowed there are a lot of things that are going against these manufacturers particularly small and medium manufacturers but they will overcome because only when they overcome this they they put all their resources into the recovery and when it comes uh, you know uh, jacked up with the increase in demand when the production goes up productivity goes up and that is going to be a sharp recovery but the only thing that we do not know right now is how long are we going to be in this trench of v shape to our recovery okay ma'am thank you ma'am one more question is available ma'am it's a possible for change the type of production for small scale industries difficult they say difficult there are two schools of thought one they say is very difficult for certain kind of small scale uh, uh, manufacturing facility which involves huge investment in the uh, capital uh, you know equipments say for like a foundry for example i have put all my money in foundry so i cannot quickly change that but it, there are other school of thought says the small manufacturing units are the most flexible ones they are most innovative ones most of our grassroots level innovation had always come from very small uh, you know micro tiny uh, cottage industries so uh, it is absolutely possible Okay. Would you, you allow me to uh, take another question? There is a question that I see here. We see. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, who is this, Shri Vashni? Um, we see a lot of people holding stuff like toilet papers, uh, like you said. What happens to supply chains when people hoard? Good. Um, you know, there is um, there is a there is a, a theory in supply chain. you know there is an effect in supply chain that we have noticed world over we call it as a bull whip effect you know like uh, when the customers are buying too much then the supermarkets are seeing that their shelves are getting empty so they panic and they place a huge order to their distributors and when distributors are looking at various supermarkets coming with huge orders two times three times more than what the end customer wants so they place their orders to manufacturers they jack up their orders so manufacturers to be to give that margin of safety pass on this pressure of this huge number to their suppliers so that is why it is called bull whip effect you know one small movement of your hand you know goes through the whip and gives us a big lash on the bull that you are riding so what happens actually is unnecessary holding of your uh, inventory in in the places that are actually not needed and let us also uh, be warned when a customer when you as a customer are walking into a supermarket wanting to buy 100 packs of toilet paper instead of two that you want for um i think uh, for your mom then we are placing extreme pressure on those workers who are working in the factory you are making them work overtime you are removing them from their home from their families for making a product that you really are not going to need you buy that today and tomorrow you're not going to buy anything so it's a strain so it's a good idea for all of us to be informed that somebody is smiling i like that smile um uh, informed that we need to uh, be very judicious very realistic in uh, stuff that we are buying because the pressure on the supply chain could be enormous and in this pressure but there are small firms that buckle and die under this pressure they cannot take this kind of orders there is a huge order today and for the next two weeks no orders can break the back of any small manufacturer so thank you for that question that was a good one 
Ma'am, one more question is available in chat box, ma'am. If there is any special act in MSME Act in India related to SCM? Supply chain management? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma um, there is, I mean, um, um, there is a there is a re amendment of the act also. You heard Modi ji sp speak about that. In fact, the very definition of MSME is getting um, uh, altered. Um, if you look at supply chain management, it is about businesses. It is about networks. So there is nothing um, you know that you would say is exclusive for your supply chain. Anything that affects your businesses affect your supply chain. But supply, supply chain is largely a philosophy. It is a kind of lens that you wear, glasses that you wear to look at your businesses. People don't look at their business inside the fortress anymore. They look at a, a network of business and there is no your profit, my profit inside the supply chain. If you are working together, you generate the surplus that could be delivered to the end customer. So all these amendments, you know, uh, giving more time to repay loans is going to affect your supply chain. Um, exempting duty for uh, the long time to come is going to affect your supply chain. Uh, excise duty redefinitions is definitely going to, uh, uh, you know, affect your supply chain. So any uh, amendments, any act that uh, affects the businesses, even the sourcing and funding uh, investment decisions of businesses, small businesses will affect their supply chain. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your yes. sweet and valuable answers, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Reverend, yeah. madam. Thank you, madam. You have, madam. Uh, I I see one more question, Lavanya. Oh, okay, ma'am. Can okay. I take a minute? Okay, okay, with pleasure. Yeah, there is a question from Vinod Balakrishna. Shall I read while out, ma'am? No, I'm while, reading it for all okay, of us. Thank while you, disruptive, thank while disruptive technologies were about to take over supply chain management, do you think? COVID disrupted the entire process. I think COVID um, um, disruptive technologies like integrated smart factories, intelligent manufacturing 4.0. Yeah, supply chain is um, already shifting to smartness. You know, they are becoming more and more intelligent and smart. And those that have made the transition to uh, this, uh, you know, smart setup already, we have we are noticing have suffered lesser during COVID. The way COVID affected, I would put it this way: the way COVID affected businesses, those businesses that were have invested heavily on being intelligent, data driven collecting and using data to make business decisions. They have remarkably survived. And those businesses, small or big, that have been hesitant, lethargic, slow in making this transition towards uh, 4.0 technologies, integrated factory technologies, data-driven technologies, analytics, um, 3D printing, robotics, cloud computing, um, you know, um, cyber security. So these kind of technologies, those companies that have not made their transition for any reason, we have seen them being hit really hard because simply for the reason that the communication suffered, they could not see what was coming. They could not estimate the impact of um, the demand disruption, supply shocks. So their response was either absent or they were slow. So those were the decisions, uh, those were the companies that were getting really hit because of COVID. So COVID actually is, has given us a good case to make this shift towards disruptive technologies. Uh, Vinod, uh, I hope I answered your question. Um, if there are any, um, I am looking at 
uh, the chat box. Um, That's a lot of thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know who's the madam they are referring to. In case if it is me, um, you are most welcome. I hope uh, you could learn something from this talk. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful session, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Lavanya, and thank you, sisters. Uh, it was um, a very nice opportunity to meet your uh, students, to meet your audience and speak to them. I hope it was of some value to you. And, yes, and I, I also thank you for my own students uh, who among uh, their busy internship time, you know, found time to kind of listen to me again. I thought they would be bored and they didn't want to come here. And thanks to my students also. Ma'am, one more question in the chat box, ma'am. Is it yes. possible for you to answer, ma'am? Yeah, I'm free. Yeah. Is the socialistic model is good for supply chain management? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this can get a little political. Um, but yeah, what is the alternative? You know, I would choose to call this as a market driven model rather than socialist model. But what is the alternative? Communism? Communism is not even uh, alive in China anymore. Mm. Not in North Korea. In fact, I don't know you and I do not know what is happening in North Korea. But in places where communism was born, they are not following it any, uh, anymore. Let us not call it as socialistic items or socialist model. Let us call it as a market-driven model. See, look at it. It is very simple. There is a need. People want stuff. If I want something, then I have to pay for it. And if I want to pay for it, I should be willing to pay for it. And I should pay for it from my own money. If I want my own money, then I have to work. And where do I go to work? I go to work to produce the things that I want. So it's just a simple model. And there are entrepreneurs, people who are setting up, um, uh, who are uh, setting up uh, uh, these factories, they're entrepreneurs, they are taking risks. Okay, so uh, they need to be rewarded. Well, if this is um, my answer to your question, but I also think there is another possibility. Maybe the question is, a stochastic model, no? A stochastic model, will it help in uh, supply chain? If that is your question, and here is the answer to that question. See, stochastic meaning probabilistic. Stochastic means there is an absence of surety, certainty. When I do not know something is going to happen for sure, then uh, this uncertainty could be modeled in order to make decisions. So this kind of modeling of incomplete information, uncertainty is called stochastic. And that is my only hope now. See, if you look at information availability as a spectrum, in one end, there is all complete information available to everyone. That is white. So whether you are going to make the decision or I am going to make the decision or anybody else, they have all the information and we are all going to make the right decision. Look at the other end of the spectrum. No information to anybody, complete darkness, okay, black. So whether you make the decision or I make the decision or anybody else, it is only a chance that you could be right. You can't blame me. I can't blame you for a wrong question, a wrong decision. But unfortunately, the world is not black. The world is not white. It is all gray. Okay. So incomplete information. So stochastic decision making, stochastic modeling, probability. So that is our only hope now. And that is the whole thing I'm based, uh, basing my decisions on. Oh, yeah, it is going to help. Thank you. You agree with me? Yes. I hope I answered that question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for your clarification. Yes. Participants, pay attention in filling the feedback. What of thanks? 
no duty is more urgent than that of returning thanks may i invite madam v anita assistant professor of our department to propose vote of thanks ma'am am i audible ma'am yes okay good afternoon to one and all present here the best and beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched they must be felt by heart yes thank you is one such prayer among them i deem it a great honor to propose vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making this webinar a resounding success first of all i would like to thank the god almighty for his wonderful blessings and presence throughout the program today my words are not enough to express the gratitude on behalf of management and business administration department i express my sincere thanks to the resource person of this webinar dr k hemamala assistant professor amrita school of business who graced us with her thought provoking address about supply chain in the post covid world thank you ma'am for your valuable information we are grateful to our principal reverend dr sister j sirani for her words of encouragement her able guidance has always encouraged us i thank for her kindness and continuous support her presence today in this function has immensely enhanced its importance we are extremely grateful to you sister for your insightful address i express my deep gratitude to our respected mother superior and secretary reverend dr b j kensley jayanti for her guidance to us in all our activities ensure that we always do the right thing in the right way it's my privilege to thank our head of the department mrs jasmine selvapakiam for her guidance and support for making the webinar a fruitful one it's my great pleasure to convey my heartfelt thank to dr n lavan lakshmi convener and mrs revathi organizing secretary for arranging such a wonderful webinar we the department of bba are grateful to dr such as shantameri joshita head and assistant professor department of C computer science for her committed and dedicated technical support for this webinar and also i extend my thanks to mr purushottaman and ms bhuvaneshwari technician for their tireless support in technical side finally it's my duty to express my thanks to the participants from various institutions for their kind cooperation during the webinar once again i thank you one and all stay home stay safe thank you thank you madam as a convener it's my duty to say special thanks to all the participants and the persons who motivate me and come along with me throughout this webinar thank you one and all let us all leave the meeting thank you